Welcome to Maps of Speech. My name is Donald Derrick, a senior lecturer at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Today, I am presenting research that Professor Brian Jick of the University of British Columbia in Canada and I completed on gait change during tongue motion. Watching people run and horses gallop inspires us. We all remember the rush of wind in our hair as we ran our hearts out in races as children. We all remember escaping from our friends during games of tag, the elation of catching a bus, or the rage we feel when the driver rejects our efforts and pulls away. This deep experiential connection makes us obsessed with the way animals move. In the late 19th century, our obsession with whether horses lift all their legs off the ground during a full gallop pushed Edward Muybridge to set up an array of cameras to photograph a horse in a gallop. And he got the money shot, the legs off the ground. And it isn't just the speed of it all. That stumbling transition when humans switch their gait from walking to running has captured our imagination since ancient times. Our pursuit for explanations of these transitions led to advancements in coordinate system analysis, physiology, stopwatches, fast photography, force plates, motion capture systems, and even blood gas analysis. Thousands of experiments and tens of thousands of articles have been written in an effort to improve our understanding of why animals change gait as they move faster. Yet we still argue whether gait change is about metabolic efficiency, mechanical load, mechanical efficiency, or cognitive factors. That is, are animals trying to save energy and use less oxygen at different speeds? Are they trying to avoid straining their skeletons? Are they trying to move efficiency? Or is gait change mostly about how animals' minds and bodies plan out motion? And the reason we get so frustrated trying to find out why animals change gait is that the reason for gait change seems to depend on skeletal shape, speed of motion, the evenness of the surface, the incline of the surface, mood, tiredness, and quite possibly even subtle differences in the gravitational force at that particular place. So Dr. Jick and I decided to throw as many of these constraints and trash as humanly possible. What happens to a movement system that has no skeleton or other rigid parts, that is performing tasks that are not innate to the functioning of the body and brain, as is locomotion, and is tasked with moving faster and slower, much the way we do when we switch from walking to running? The tongue during speech provides such a system. The tongue has no skeleton except the jaw on which it rides and the small hyoid bone at the base that stabilizes the tongue muscles. Otherwise, the tongue is flexible like an elephant's trunk or the tentacles of a squid. The tongue does have innate controls for sucking, chewing, and swallowing, but speech is not one of those systems. Instead, we as children learn how to speak the language of our parents and community. And unlike with learning how to walk and run, we don't all converge on the same patterns of behavior at all. The tongue is also light. It doesn't have to bear the weight of a whole body when moving. The tongue's only restrictions on freedom of motion come from the surrounding vocal tract, its own ability to stretch, and the goals of whatever speech task is assigned to it. So, given this huge level of freedom, we asked, Will the tongue reveal patterns of motion that look at all like rigid gates? And if so, will the tongue switch those gates between slower and faster speech? And the experiment we used to answer this question had a lot of complicated requirements. Because the speech task can constrain the tongue a lot, we gave speakers tasks with maximum freedom of tongue motion choice during speech. In North American English, both the classic R sounds and the flaps, like the D sound in the ladder that you climb and the D sound in the name of the Latter-day Saints, can be produced with a huge array of tongue shapes and directions of motion. So we had people say one of eight words or phrases, like edita or auditor. Each word has two flaps in a row and many combinations of normal and R-like vowels surrounding the flaps. We put the phrases in a carrier phrase, as in, we may edit a book. These phrases were selected to avoid interfering with tongue motion. Their consonants use the lips, only forcing specific tongue motion for the final K in books. We had the speakers speak at one of five different speech rates, not by timing them to a metronome like your piano teacher might have done, but by having them hear reiterant speech 
Ma mama ma mama produced at one of five different speech rates from three to seven syllables per second and asking them to read the relevant phrase at the reiterant speed as best they can. People were therefore free to succeed or fail at the task according to their own natural ability. We did this because we had to leave the tongue as free as possible to move the way the speaker would normally speak. This freedom was in part required because the experiment involved not just audio recording, but gluing wired sensors to the tongue so we could track its motion. And those sensors interfere with the tongue motion plenty enough. Because of the complicated setup, the experiment took two hours for each participant, and it was tiring. I participated in similar experiments, and you can see me in this photo looking plenty exhausted and pathetic by the end. We are, it must be said, very grateful to our participants. Now you can imagine that when this experiment was complete, we had tongue motion data that differed for each utterance, each unique word, each unique speech rate, and each participant. The data was an absolute mess of diverse complexity. Turning our data into something we could understand was quite the task. First, we had to take our audio recordings and mark the start and end of each relevant word. Then we identified the center of each flap by finding the points of lowest acoustic amplitude. We then broke up the timing into 31 time slices and used tongue position information from those points for every piece of analysis to follow. That way, regardless of actual speech rate, we could compare the relative timings of tongue position visually, the way you see in these images of the human vocal tract here. You can see here examples of speakers who do not change their tongue position patterns much for the same word, no matter how slowly or quickly you ask them to speak. The blue lines overlap the red pretty well. You can see other speakers who change the pattern of motion a lot between their slowest and fastest speech. The blue and the red lines don't match at all. It doesn't take a lot of examples to show you that speakers really move their tongues around in a lot of different ways, depending on the speaker, the words they spoke, and their speech rates. If you have a lot of experience with statistics, you know that most of the usual analysis tools we have are useless in the face of this much variability. We had to use a single measurement that could characterize this variability in a useful and vaguely intuitive way. If you take any single tongue sensor, you can imagine stretching out its position into a straight line, and that gets you the cumulative linear distance. You can also imagine adding up all the changes in rotation, and that gets you the cumulative angular displacement. Scale them and add them together, and you get a single measurement that characterizes the movement or displacement of that part of the tongue. Compare the numbers for the slowest and fastest speech rates we recorded, and you get the displacement range. We then compared the displacement range to the actual length of time each word took to produce for each participant and speech rate. This information graphs very nicely and lets you see the relationship between the displacement range of tongue motion and the time range between slowest and fastest speech. We used a statistical test called the Generalized Linear Mixed Effect Model to show that these relationships are highly statistically significant. What you see is relatively intuitive. Speakers that can speak more slowly and more quickly also displace their tongues less for their fast speech and more for their slow speech. Their tongue displacement ranges correlate positively with their speech rate range. You can then look at the actual motion for the narrowest and widest displacement ranges and compare what the tongue tip and tongue body actually do for slow and fast speech. You can see that there are some differences, but not many for tongue tip and tongue body motion for speakers with narrow tongue front displacement ranges. But for speakers with wide tongue front displacement ranges, the differences between slow and fast speech are quite extreme. When they speak quickly, they move their tongues in a simple pattern. Think of that pattern as a kind of running. When they speak slowly, they move their tongues in a more complex pattern. Think of that pattern as a kind of walking. These obviously categorical differences we see for people with really wide tongue front displacement ranges are the first evidence of different gates in tongue motion. But while that might be sufficient for most of us, many people who study gait change want to see two stable gates and a pattern of instability between the two. Just as you stumble a little bit when you slow down from a run to a walk, 
they want to see the tongue stumble between speech rates. The usual ways of getting that information require you to force speakers to speak more slowly or more quickly at really tiny increments to capture the stumbles. We did not do that kind of experiment in part because it really makes it hard to observe the movement rate ranges you saw earlier. It makes it hard to see realistic speech behavior during unrealistic speech. However, about 10 years ago, some psychoanalysts who wanted to predict psychotic episodes in mental hospitals came up with a measurement that can get a similar information during the time course of production of each and every utterance used in this experiment. It lets you look at wobbles in tongue motion and gives a linear number for the size and frequency of those wobbles. This number is a measurement of critical fluctuations, which both predict future breakdowns in motion, but also describe speech effort in a meaningful way. The nice thing about being able to look at effort during the production of these sequences is that more effort at the beginning of the sequence in exchange for less at the end is a measure of something called the end state comfort effect. If you pick up a cup and put it down directly, you do it like this. But if you intend to flip it over, you are likely to twist your arm in an uncomfortable start position to make your arm comfortable when you are done. This end state comfort effect is a well-known measure of motor planning. When you see it, you know the actions were planned in advance. When you instead see beginning state comfort, you know the person put less effort into planning the motion sequence you see. So you can distinguish speech motion that has stable gait patterns from speech motion that does not. So we calculated these measurements and applied a nonlinear statistical tool called a generalized additive mixed effect model to the data. Here you see a graph that separates the data by tongue front displacement range. Think of the graph on speech rate rotated 90 degrees. When you are looking at is a kind of topographical map where blue are regions of low effort and orange are regions of high effort. You can see that for the narrow tongue front displacement range, most of the effort was at the beginning of each utterance. That makes sense because the speakers used roughly the same tongue motion patterns for slow and fast speech. That is, all the data used to produce this part of the graph was produced with one very stable gait-like pattern. The speakers probably use it all the time during their normal conversational speech, and so they know how to plan that pattern well. Similarly, if you look at the top of the graph, most of the effort is at the beginning of each utterance, less at the end. It is not quite as extreme as the bottom of the graph because we used all the data at all the speech rates for this part of the graph. That includes the medium speech rates where people would sometimes have unstable patterns between their slow and fast gates. That unstable data hides some of the really strong results you see at the bottom of the graph, but not much. But when you look at the middle of the graph, these are speakers who use only one gait, but they stretch it a lot for slow speech and less for fast speech. They don't keep to one stable gait like the speakers with the narrowest tongue front displacement ranges. They don't use two gates like the speakers with the widest tongue front displacement ranges. Instead, they more often react to the requested speech rate instead of planning for it. And that is why you see more effort at the end of their sequences compared to the beginning. These patterns of behavior demonstrate that as speakers extend their tongue front displacement ranges, they get a wider speech rate range. And they can only stretch the pattern of one gate so far before they instead break into two gates, one for slow speech and one for fast speech. This division into two gates gives them access to a wider speech rate range than their compatriots. So what we show here is that at the heart of gate change, you will not find any of saving energy, reduction of strain, mechanical load, or even a specific and narrow cognitive reason for the switch. Instead, the motor system generates two or more gates in order to widen the motion rate range. Imagine enough time and an evolutionary system that can slowly change the motion system, and you can imagine the motivating mechanism for the generation of a skeletal body that can accommodate stable multiple gates during locomotion. 
If there is a fitness-based reason for the organism to have a wide movement rate range and multiple gates can allow for increases in movement rate ranges, you have a plausible evolutionary mechanism for the generation of movement systems with multiple gates. How amazing is that?